Good evening and welcome to Sun Middle Temple. We are so happy you have joined us. My name is Alba and I use she, her pronouns. This is our first December service and I'm so happy that you are here. As always, the service is recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel. This month we have a few events going on, including an ugly sweater contest, a recipe collection, a movie night, and a New Year's party. We also have our end of the year survey running as well, and our time updates for 2024, which are super important, and please, I beg you to fill them out! And the links are available on all of our social media pages, as well as in our Discord. So we will open today uh, with our opening words, which will appear on the slide behind you. Feel free to listen or read along at home. We welcome you into the light of the gods and light this flame in celebration. May its brightness symbolize our connection to the gods and the natural world. May you join us in this community of faith, cherishing love and with open hearts. So our theme this month, as is fitting, is light in the darkness. Uh, And our readings today are Hector and Andromache from Book 6 and the Phoenix role of Patrocles from Book 23, both from the Iliad by Homer, translated by Samuel Butler. Please keep in mind that these clips can be pretty sad, so if you are not in the headspace to hear them, please skip this observance. So our first clip is Hector and Andromache. When he had gone through the city and reached the Sakian gates through which he would go out onto the plain, his wife came running towards him, Andromache, daughter of the great Yitzhan, who ruled Thebes under the wooded slopes of Mount Placus, and was king of the Sicilians. His daughter had married Hector, and now came to meet him with a nurse who carried his little child in her bosom, a mere babe, Hector's darling son, and lovely as a star. Hector had named him Scamandrius, but the people called him Astynax, for his father stood alone as chief guardian of Elias. Hector smiled as he looked upon the boy, but he did not speak, and Andromache stood by him weeping, taking his hand in her own. Dear husband, said she, your valor will bring you destruction. Think on your infant son, and on my hapless self, who ere long shall be your widow. For the Achaeans will set upon you in a body and kill you. It would be better for me, should I lose you, to lie dead and buried, for I shall have nothing left to comfort me when you are gone, save only sorrow. I have neither father nor mother now. Achilles slew my father when he sacked Thebes, the goodly city of the Sicilians. He slew him, but did not for very shame despoil him when he had burned him in his wondrous armor. He raised a barrow over his ashes, and the mountain nymphs, daughters of Aegeus bearing Jove, planted a grove of elms about his tomb. I had seven brothers in my father's house, but on the same day they all went within the house of Hades. Achilles killed them, as they were with their sheep and cattle. My mother, who had been queen of all the land under Mount Placus, he brought hither with the spoil, and freed her for a great sum, but the archer queen Diana took her in the house of your father, Nay, Hector, you who to me are father, mother, brother, and dear husband, have mercy upon me. Stay here upon this wall. Make not your child fatherless and your wife a widow. As for the host, place them near the fig tree, where the city can best be scaled, and the wall is weakest. Thrice have the bravest of them come thither and assailed it under the two Ajaxes, Idiomenus, son of Artris, and brave son of Titus, either of their own bidding or because some soothsayer had told them. And Hector answered, Wife, I too have thought about upon all this, but with what face should I look upon the Trojans, men or women, if I shirk battle like a coward? I cannot do so. For I know nothing save to fight bravely in the forefront of the Trojan host and win renown alike for my father and myself. Well do I know that the day will surely come when mighty Ilus shall be destroyed with Pyram and Pyram's people. I, but I grieve for none of these, not even for Hecuba nor King Pyram, for my, nor for my brothers and brave who may fall in the dust before their foes. For none of these do I grieve as for yourself, when the day shall come on which 
Some one of the Achaeans shall rob you forever of your freedom and bear you weeping away. It may be that you will have to ply the loom in Argos at the bidding of a mistress, or to fetch water from the springs of Messius or Hyperia, treated brutally by some cruel taskmaster. Then will one who sees you weeping, she was the wife to Hector, the bravest warrior among the Trojans during the war before Ilus. On this your tears will break forth anew, for him who would have put away the day of captivity from you. May I lie dead under the barrel that is heaped over my body, ere I hear you cry as they carry you into bondage. He stretched his arms towards his child, but the boy cried and nestled in his nurse's bosom, scared at the sight of his father's armor and at the horse plume that nodded fiercely from his helmet. His father and mother laughed to see him, but Hector took the helmet from his head, laid it all gleaming upon the ground. Then he took his darling child, kissed him, and dandled him in his arms, praying over him the while to Jove and to all the gods. Jove, he cried, grant that this my child may be even as myself, chief among the Trojans. Let him be not less excellent in strength, and let him rule Ilias with his might. Then may one say of him as he comes from battle, The son is far better than the father. May he bring back the blood-stained spoils of him whom he has laid low, and let his mother's heart be glad. With this he laid the child in the arms of his wife, who took him to her own soft bosom, smiling through her tears. As her husband watched her, his heart yearned towards her, and he caressed her fondly, saying, my own wife, do not take these things too bitterly to heart. No one can hurry me down to Hades before my time. But if a man's hour is to come, be he brave or be he coward, there is no escape for him. When he has once been born, go then within the house and busy yourself with your daily duties, your loom, your distaff, and the ordering of your servants. For war is a man's matter, and mine above all others of them that have been born in Ilis. He took his plumed helmet from the ground, and his wife went back again to her house, weeping bitterly, and often looking back towards him. When she reached her home, she found her maidens within, and bade them all join in her lament. So they mourned Hector in his own house, though he was yet alive, for they deemed that they should never see him return safe from battle and from the furious hands of the Achaeans. Our next reading is from Book 23, and is the funeral of Patroclus. Then the princes of the Achaeans took the son of Peleus to Agamemnon, but hardly could they persuade him to come with them, so wroth was he for the death of his comrade. As soon as they reached Agamemnon's tent, they told the serving men to set a large tripod over the fire in case they might persuade the son of Peleus to wash the clotted gore from this body, but he denied them sternly and swore with a solemn oath, saying, Nay, by King Jove, first and mightiest of all gods, it is not meet that water should touch my body till I have laid Patroclus on the flames and have built him a barrow and shaved my head. For so long as I live, no such second sorrow shall ever draw nigh me. Now therefore, let us do all this sad festival demands. But at break of day, King Agamemnon, bid your men bring wood and provide all else that the dead man may duly take into the realm of darkness. The fire shall thus burn him out of our sight the sooner, and the people shall turn again to their own labors. Thus he did speak, and they did even as he had said. They made haste to prepare the meal, they ate, and every man had his full share so that all were satisfied. As soon as they had enough to eat and drink, the others went to their rest, each in his own tent, but the son of Peleus lay grieving among his myrmidons by the shore of the surrounding sea in an open place where the waves came surging in one after another. 
Here a very deep slumber took hold upon him and eased the burden of his sorrows, for his limbs were weary with chasing Hector round windy Ilis. Presently the sad voice of Patroclus drew near him like what he had been in stature, voice, and the light of his beaming eyes, clad too as he had been clad in life. His spirit hovered over his head and said, You sleep, Achilles, and have forgotten me. You loved me living, but now that I am dead, you think of me no further. Bury me with all speed that I may pass the gates of Hades, the ghosts' vain shadows of men that can labor no more. Drive me away from them. They will not yet suffer me to join those that are beyond the river, and I wander all desolate by the wide gates of the house of Hades. Give me now your hand, I pray you, for when you have once given me my dues of fire, never shall I again come forth out of the house of Hades. Never more shall we sit apart and take sweet counsel among the living. The cruel fate, which was my birthright, has yawned its wide jaws around me. Nay, you too, Achilles, peer of gods, are doomed to die beneath the wall of the noble Trojans. One prayer more I will make you, if you will grant it. Let not my bones be laid apart from yours, Achilles, but with them, even as we were brought up together in your own house when that what time Menoetus brought you to me as a child from Opius, because by sad spite I had killed the son of Amphidamus, not of set purpose, but in childish quarrel over the dice. The knight Pelus took me into his house and treated me kindly and named me to be your squire. Therefore let our bones lie but in a single urn, the two-handled golden vase given to you by your mother. And Achilles answered, Why, true heart, are you come hither to lay these charges upon me? I will of my own self do all as you have bidden me. Draw closer to me. Let us once more throw our arms around another and find sad comfort in the sharing of our sorrows. He opened his arms toward him as he spoke and would have clasped him in there, but there was nothing, and the spirit vanished as vapor, gibbering and whining into the earth. Achilles sprang to his feet, smote his two hands, and made lamentation, saying, Of a truth, even in the house of Hades, there are ghosts and phantoms that have no life in them. All night long the sad spirit of Patroclus has hovered overhead, making piteous moaning, telling me what I am to do for him, and looking wondrously like himself. Thus he did speak, and his words set them all weeping and mourning about the poor dumb dead, till rosy-fingered born appeared. Then King Agamemnon sent mule, men and mules from all parts of camp to bring wood, and Marionus, squire to Idiomenus, was in charge over them. They went out with woodsmen's axes and strong ropes in their hands, and before them went the mules. Up hill and down dale did they go, by straightways and crooked, and when they reached the heights of many fountained Ida, they laid their axes to the roots of many a tall branching oak that came thundering down as they felled it. They split the trees and bound them behind the mules, which then wended their way as they best could through the thick brushwood onto the plain. All who had been cutting wood bore logs for the Marionus squire to Idiomenus had bid them, and they threw them down in a line upon the seashore at the place where Achilles would make a monument for Patrocles and for himself. Both of these stories are about retaining humanity and light in the midst of war and darkness. In the first, Hector and Andromache celebrate their son and love him, and in the second, the Greeks stop to say goodbye to a fallen comrade, all in the midst of war. All of these people embrace the darkness and the light that occurs seems even brighter by contrast. The contrast of the bright holiday lights against the dark of the Christmas tree and the house against the fabric of the night sky both shine bright in the darkness and are a part of classic winter celebration as well as leading lights in the dark of winter. Gifts, family, friends, and food 
all bring light to the darkness of winter, or adding light to it if you're in the southern hemisphere. Embrace the darkness in contrast to the night and celebrate the contrast. We will now move into the ritual part of the observance. If you want to, you can join us at home or read the words aloud or just listen. Say, please remember to do the end of year um, survey as it has some questions on this part. We leave this offering for our guides to symbolize our connection and devotion. We gift this water to accept the flow of our lives. We gift this rock to symbolize the stability of gods in the world. We welcome life and bless our offerings with oil to share our riches. We embrace our connection to each other and the world and celebrate our revival. As we move out into the world, let us remember our community of faith. Cherish love and open your heart as you walk through life. Hold dear the light of the gods and our connection with the natural world. Go forth in celebration and carry the light of connection within your heart. Good evening and welcome to Sun Middle Temple.